Hi all, welcome to Theoretically Podcasting. This is Vasu Sham, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by uh, Professor John Donahue, if I said that correctly. <laughs> welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so the subject of our discussion today, uh, I thought would be um, the question of what what we should what we should call the problem of quantum gravity or, or how to phrase it appropriately. And um, I found a paper of yours uh, from last year, if I'm getting that correctly, to be very enlightening on this topic. Uh, and I thought that it would just work as a, as a sort of uh, public service announcement <laughs> to go <Okay>. over <laughs> uh, the, the concepts you lay out there, because I find that there are there are confusions that seem to be festering uh, a lot longer than they really should be, given what we know about effective field theory and everything. So um, I guess we could, we could, we could open with um, your sort of word level answer to the question uh, and we can sort of move into your paper further. So, so how would you, how would you characterize the problem of quantum gravity? What, what do you think we should call it? Right. So it's, it's long been said that the gravity and quantum mechanics are incompatible. And I that phrasing may have felt correct at one stage. I, I don't think it's correct anymore. General relativity and quantum mechanics go together like other of our theories, with the exception that uh, general relativity sort of points to its own demise in the in, in, in its ability to describe the, the world as a field theory, um, whereas others are technically complete to energies beyond where we probe them. Right. Um, so general relativity works fine as a quantum field theory. In fact, I'll make the joke later on that it's the best quantum field theory known to, known to man. Um, and and it follows the rules that we've learned for other effective field theories. In fact, it may be, may be the best illustration of how effective field theory reasoning works that I know of. So, yeah, so... But, you know, it's true though, that, that, that there are issues in, in gra quantum gravity that, because the effective field theory points to its own limitations. And that fact, then it's interesting to understand where the limitations are and what's happening near the borderline of this, where it breaks down. Right, right. So so um, before we get into the, the details, I think we should uh, plant a flag on um, your characterization of general relativity as an effective field theory, which also supersedes the statement that general relativity thought of as a quantum field theory is non-renormalizable and hence just just can't can't be used so, so um I, this is one of those one of those things that people seem i mean the, the people that work with effective field theories are perfectly um uh, knowledgeable about but but most people just seem to have missed the fact that we're able to do quite a lot indeed we're able to quantize non-renormalizable field theories as well provided we know where to apply them so so uh i feel like that yeah so yeah so i can talk about that a little bit if you'd like um sure. the, yeah so the the phrase non-renormalizable is is an unfortunate one because in fact we know how to renormalize non-renormalizable theories <laughs> Um, the the feature of effective field theories is is that what, when you renormalize them, there'll be there'll be new operators that are be present that are local operators that are needed to observe the divergences. But those are just they're ones that would be there in general if just given following from the th symmetries of the theory. So we would expect these operators to be there. Given the symmetries of the theory, and they're sure that sure enough, they're the needed to, to observe the infinities. But we can still make predictions in, in an energy expansion. And the predictions at low energies just depend on the low energy degrees of freedom and the low energy interactions. Those are the ones we know. 
Um, sometimes I I like to you know pose the question to my quantum, quantum mechanics students of why do quantum predictions work at all, or calculations work at all? Because if you have let's say perturbation theory where you sum over all states, all states includes things that we haven't discovered yet. Right. How 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 can you ever make predictions if you have to sum over all states? And that effective field theory answers that very well is that the effects of the unknown physics of high energies are contained in local operators at low energies. Right. And the renormalization program just just adds to that. The divergences are also unreliable. They just go, but they they're un unphysical. Well, they're not they're not visible when working at low energies indeed indeed yeah so so let's let's now sort of put uh meat on the sort of skeleton of the argument we've laid out here and uh, i guess right. we could dive into your your paper from uh from last year okay if you'd like to yes i can share the screen and pull up the paper great. there that should be up great okay yeah, and and again, already in the introduction, there's uh, <laughs> one of the other very nice um, sort of well, or, or or very confusing questions that uh, some some would really like answered in a certain way, but but um, and that being the question of whether the graviton exists. Uh, so I guess we could we could start from there. I mean, um, what what is your take on the question? Is it would you say that this is a physical question to ask? Well, I mean, it's certainly it's it's a physical question because one could, in principle, detect gravitons if the Planck scale was different. Sure, it's very really hard to detect them given the present the known value of the Planck scale. But nevertheless, if it were different, it would be, it'd be we'd be having gravitons floating around like we have pions floating around. Right, um, right. So that. I think the question is a physical one. I was, I've always been sort of annoyed by it. So it's, uh, it's strange for me to put in writing some answer, except that I, I particularly liked the, the argument. It's due to Dan Carey, Carney. Okay. Um, and Dan, and, and the argument does have something to do with the, essence of effective field theories is that that the the effective field theories tell you that the the physics of the world organizes itself in a quantum field theory at a given energy with the degrees of freedom that are present at that energies and quantum field theories are actually very restricting they they Well, in quantum mechanics, you have the potential. You can imagine one over R to the six potentials. In field mm -hmm. theory, you don't get that. You you get only get particle exchange, and that you then decompose your one over R to the six van der Waals force into part two particle two photon exchange. Um, but the essence is always the single particle, mm -hmm. and the graviton then, if experiment sort of tells us what that has to be. We mm -hmm. we know from the Newtonian potential that it it's momentum space representation is one over q squared. You make that relativistic. So here's the the argument about making it relativistic: is you take the one over q squared, that's the strict Newtonian low energy limit, and it becomes one over the um, the four momentum q squared. Right, and then that has a a a pole in it that you have to decide how to treat. If you do the wrong thing, you don't get unitarity or causality or the other properties that we, we know and love. Mm -hmm. So if you insist that whatever this is, is unitarity, unitary and causal, et cetera, you get either plus I epsilon or minus I epsilon uh, there which just differ by an arrow of causality. I can talk mm -hmm. about that later. 
But those then automatically have a pole, and that pole yes. is the graph. So right, right, right. This this to me is sort of the essence of if you're going to organize things in a, as a, in our standard way of of describing interactions, then these pro simple properties tell you that there has to be a pole there. Yeah, what what I like about this argument is that you aren't actually you're basically using the sort of um fundamental properties of a quantum field theory to um argue your way to the inevitability of there being a graviton as in it's not that this is like um this isn't relying on uh, doing some expansion or you know some flat background and this and that which of course is consistent with, with what you're describing here but basically you're saying well you need to have uh lorentz invariance um you know, unitarity, causality, et cetera. And you find that then the propagator that you get, uh, and, and again, remembering that that the pole, the propagator is uh, giving you information about the physical spectrum of the theory, you sort of just see that there has to be this uh, this excitation. So I, I, I very much enjoyed this uh, yeah. rather, rather yes, slick well, argument we have here. Right, somehow the, 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 the nice thing about this particular argument is that you don't ever have to invoke commutators of fields or, mm -hmm. you know, quantum gravity becomes very confusing if you think of it in terms of X commuted with P is I, I H bar. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it from a path integral standpoint where you have fields in your Lagrangian and you integrate over them and you get quantum quantum fields and classical limits, it makes much more sense. And so there's a unity of the field theory description. And this is sort of reflecting that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, so now that that's out of the way, I mean, it, it only um, makes sense that <laughs> these gravitons right. are sort of part of a larger, larger story, um, which is that, yeah, we basically have... <laughs> Right. An effective field theory, as we just described. Um, right. So, so the the techniques of effective field theory, when applied to general relativity, would say that we should write a local Lagrangian that has the symmetry. So we don't we don't know the full theory, but mm -hmm. we do know symmetry at low energies, and that's general covariance, yes. the morphism invariance. And so we any local structure that we build should contain that symmetry and so we can just start doing that and it mm -hmm. organizes itself nicely in zero derivatives two derivatives four derivatives etc um so simply from the idea that we know what the field is and what the symmetry is we end up with this effective lagrangian and then we can just ask questions about it. And one of the first things that you see easily is that these higher derivative terms are essentially irrelevant at low energies. Mm -hmm. So that you end up with Einstein, the Einstein Hilbert action. Um, and so you would then use the Einstein Hilbert action as the low energy description, and you proceed with the quantization of that right right and and briefly uh as it, as we see on the screen right now you mentioned that these higher derivative terms these four derivative terms for instance do not trigger uh the ostrogratsky instability uh which yeah. you know I'll remind the listeners is um a, one of the consequences classically of having higher derivatives in a in a lagrangian is that you're going to find that the hamiltonian when you suitably define all the correct canonical variables will ha will seem to be unbounded from below um and you do have a very nice sort of other paper where you go over a very, you know like a, a related example uh to 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 this uh sort of quadratic gravity story but, but i mean um could you sort of briefly describe yeah. uh how the yeah. circumvention happens yeah, so I I think more useful than doing that other paper, which I which I like nevertheless, is to go back. I I used ENM as an example before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and um, to sh show to show that we know experimentally that this doesn't happen. Because right. if you if you do the quantum corrections in E and M, mm -hmm. and you look at the low energy limit, you end up with the usual effect of Lagrangian, and and a term with higher derivatives. So here's this is four derivatives. Right. So, so just to be clear, um, here you, you've you've sort of integrated out a massive fermion. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So I, there's a massive fermion. So this guy is massive. I've integrated it out, and the the actually here's the formula the, for the result in momentum space. Yeah. But that's equivalent to a local Lagrangian. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Which, which is the the one that I in the next equation. Right. Right. Okay, so so yes, I have integrated out in this case a heavy field, um, and I'm looking at at the physics of photons below that scale. Yeah, and and so I like this because we know experimentally that this does not trigger any instability. Indeed. So the the reason that it can can be correct is that this Lagrangian is only to be, be applied in regions where the energies, which is like the box, is small compared to the, the mass of the, the, the fermion that I integrated out. Right. Because if energies were equivalent to the mass of the fermion, I couldn't write a local Lagrangian. I'd have to treat it dynamically. So I couldn't integrate it out. Right. And so the, the, this effect here changes when you get to high energies. And so at high energies, the issue of what happens is is not well described by this effect of Lagrangian. But at low energies, it, it, it's a nice theory. When treated perturbatively, there's no instability. And just Indeed. A, a small correction to whatever properties the draft are. And so... I, I, I think this is the better example because it's experimentally known. We, we right. don't have to worry, worry about this when, when living at low energies. And that's basically the same thing that you get when you get do these higher derivative terms. These are g, g, to, g to the fourth g type terms mm -hmm. um, because, because each curvature contains two derivatives. So at least when treated at low energy, you see the issue of of what happens at high energies is typically resolved in an effective field theory by saying that these are no longer the effective Lagrangians. You have to treat the whatever new fields are dynamically. Right, right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And uh, well, in that other paper, I mean, one nice thing that you did, which I, I thought was very illuminating, was you also had a sort of Hamiltonian um explanation for what was going on in that you found that there was a difference in ordering that that you need to sort of be mindful of uh when you actually try to quantize the uh, the appropriately defined Hamiltonian I'm just curious if I mean this is just sort of an academic curiosity <laughs> you know besides the experimental fact that we know like is, is the story roughly similar if you try to apply some kind of canonical quantization scheme to say QED and um yes. to I yeah. so in in um so the treatment that I gave there sort of follows some old work by Lee and Wick. Mm -hmm. They were trying to have a higher derivative theory involving electrons, you know, basically of QED. Right. Because they wanted a finite theory of QED. And the higher derivatives then damp the propagators at, at high energies and make QED finite. Mm-hmm. And so they they then devised a, a scheme for quantizing these. And logically, what you can think of it is, is you take the poly volars regulator that one often sees early on for as a regulation scheme and makes the field dynamical. So the one over Q squared minus lambda squared becomes one over Q squared minus M squared, where that's some, some heavy dynamical field. And there's a relative minus sign and by by choosing your quantization conditions cor this, correctly, you can make a positive uh, energy spectrum out of this, and that's 
Lee and Wicks um, cut one of their contributions to this debate. They showed how to do that. Oh, in that's the, very interesting. In yeah. the path integral framework, you don't have to go through any canonical quantization. And so you have to then see where what happens there, but you also in that paper we argue you get a positive energy spectrum. Right. Yeah, I mean let's let's plant a flag in this and sort of come back to it if we get to discussing quadratic gravity later because it'll, it'll be relevant. We can do that. Yeah. yeah. It uh, starts becoming outside of the effective field theory framework sure. because then treating the heavy particle as real uh, there be being new heavy degrees of freedom that in the effective field theory have been integrated out. Indeed, indeed. But yeah, for now, I guess we can linger. Um, and uh, what I found very nice about your paper is that you use the um, the Newtonian potential uh, in in sort of in sort of multiple ways. This is a sort of vehicle to communicate what one does in effective field theory. So first, we saw how you used it to argue that the graviton ought to exist, and um, next, you basically show how you can compute corrections to the Newtonian potential from, uh, well, basically compute the quantum corrections to it and and, and sort of work out the consequences. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's let, uh, I can I can chat through that part too. Um, because this is where the effective field theory proves its worth really. Right. Um, the, the fact, so perhaps back here we, I need to take one step before I do the, 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 the good stuff. Okay. Um, okay. I need to, I need to point out that when you when you quantize this, the Einstein action, um, which is was done by Feynman and Dewitt, uh, -huh. uh, you, and and you treat that in, in, loop processes, you of course get a divergence, and that divergence yeah. becomes proportional to these higher order terms. Tuft and Veltman did that. Here's the, the result. But then it's easy to renormalize them by defining renormalized values of these coefficients. C1 and C2, right. So that's that's why you re, that's how you renormalize it, a non-renormalizable theory. But from an effective field theory point standpoint, that's the boring part. You just mm -hmm. you just do it, but you know that these numbers are wrong. Because at high energies, there's something else going on. It's not. It's sure. not gravity. These these things may be finite. You know, if you're you got string theory or something, then maybe they're finite corrections. They may not diverge at all. Um, but so you do it. The renormalized coefficients. It's out of out of the picture. Um, the effective field theory. Then what it does is it takes the your attention and it says don't don't look at high energies let's look at low energies and let's see what happens to light particles at low energies yeah and so that's what i want to then do and i'll show, try to show you the newtonian potential um so actually i think what i'll do is let me just go over to my blank piece of paper okay okay pictures um so the Here's how you would think think about it. Let's imagine that, well, you don't imagine. If you do graviton exchange between two massive particles, you get the Newtonian potential. Yes. So that, that's reconstructed simply. And then you can imagine that there are various corrections to that due to graviton loop. So now we, we, we have a graviton, we've quantized it. There's gauge fixing and there's all the, the funny stuff that you do, but that's just technicalities. But you've got gravitons. So there would be corrections that look like this. There are vertex corrections and you know, sort of they work both ways. There's uh, a, a nice one is the vacuum vacuum polarization. Yep. There's associated with that, there's these ghosts. So that, that's supposed to be ghosts. There's there's um, there's some of the other fun ones. There's box diagrams and yeah. cross boxes. Well, let's draw something that's more interesting than that. Um, 
anyhow, you draw these. Now, the, the good part of these is, so there's two types of things that come out. There are, you know, here's, this thing is the divergent, the trusted development calculated. That's, they calculated the vacuum polarization. So two, two gravitons with a loop in there. And that's really trusted development. Um, calculation sits there. So you know there's some divergences there. And but there's also other stuff. So when you do vacuum polarization, you get you get these one over epsilons. Um, but that often comes along with log of, of the momentum transfer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Typically. And so the epsilons are uh, high energy, but log Q squared is actually a low energy effect. Right. It comes from lo long distance propagation of the the gluons. And if you know if you had a massive particle, there would be log m squared. So it's really the fact that the gluons are massless that you get log Q squared. And you you get these sort of non-analytic things out of the others here. This has that diagram would have a log Q squared. Mm -hmm. It also, uh, I'm saying this now because um, I'll probably say something again about it. Also, as a square root of Q squared non-analytic behavior, those can only come from long-distance stuff. Mm -hmm. So that the reliable parts of these calculations are are these the long, the non-analytic stuff, right? And the non-reliable stuff is is the divergences. Right, right, right. So, uh, what effect the field theory has told us is, is that the there's to look at these non-analytic stuff first. Okay, so that's that's sort of the what an effect of field theorists would see looking at these diagrams is that you're going to get the boring divergences and interesting non-analytic stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now I'll go back to the other one, and you can see. Here's here's the type of things that I just said. You you get the the leading piece, the Newtonian piece. Um, you get a square root. You get a log, and then you also get um, like some context. All the manual pieces, not analytic, analytic ones. And in fact, that's where the divergence is. I, maybe it's I should have said it on the other side, but let's write it here. Um, Let's look at the the this diagram here, the vacuum polarization, which had the divergences from Tufton development. So the Tufton development one was had four derivatives. So yep. this box is of order q to the fourth. And you get sorry. Um you get a one over q squared there, uh -huh. one over q squared there. And so this thing is a constant, just like Q squared over Q squared. Right. Okay. So the divergences sit there. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, then, you know, this is consistent with the, the logic that the divergences are local like terms. And so they can be expressed as in a power series. And anyway, so you get one over Q squared plus a constant plus Q squared plus that, et cetera. But then mm -hmm. these non-analytic stuff is the physics stuff, physics from low energies and long distance propagation. Right. So you take right. that and you Fourier transform it and you get the the log, the so the the leading piece becomes one over r. The yeah. next piece transforms to one over r squared. And yeah. the next piece goes to one over r cubed. The yep. constant goes to a delta function. And if you put H bars back in, you get, here's the quantum piece, and this is a classical piece. Yeah, and, and here I think it's interesting to note that there was a loop effect that gave rise to a classical contribution, uh, which I think, you know, this is, again, a little bit of lore for people that have actually studied the GR effective field theory that they know very well and others find very surprising, but um in well it would be great if you could say more about how how this sure. comes to be sure 
And in fact, you know, it, it surprised me at, at first, and then it only later is, becomes clear what's going on. Um, but the the we're all we're sort of taught as when that the loop expansion is the H bar expansion, mm -hmm. and that's not always true. It's that that's a folk theorem. It's not a real theorem, right? Um, and the one of the examples is, in fact, what we just calculated here is that, that you can get classical effects out of doing loops. Um, and in fact, you know that you have to. Just mm -hmm. philosophically, you know that you have to, because if the, let's say, the path integral or the Feynman diagram expansion is to describe all the physics, it has to describe classical physics and quantum physics. Indeed. And so by by doing Feynman diagrams, you're, you're going to have to reproduce everything of the world. And some of that is classical. Yeah. And in practice, the way you do it is, is these square root non-analyticities turn into classical piece, pieces and log non-analyticities become quantum pieces. Quantum. It's, right. it's an interesting picture. And this, so this has now been, you know, it's now widely recognized and is indeed a whole subfield of indeed. people doing real classical gravitational physics at, at high orders using quantum field theory techniques. Um, the fact that it's so useful is, is the surprise because it sounds like a, a difficult way to make a living. But in fact, the these modern people peop, uh, with the modern um, amplitude techniques, and... based techniques, and gravity is the square of a gauge theory. Um, yeah, all that has simplified life and and allowed us allowed them to to really make a contribution to classical physics using quantum field theory methods. Indeed. Well, I mean, this this reminds me of a joke that uh, Bob Laughlin made in a talk that I heard many years ago, maybe seven years ago, where it was a it was a uh, sort of popular uh, colloquium style talk. And then he was saying he was trying to make the case that, well, it's we just have effective field theories all the way down. And it, maybe in some sense, he was kind of right. But he was saying, well, you know, graduate students get very excited about learning about Feynman diagrams. And then I kind of asked them, well, can you draw the Feynman diagrams for milk? And uh, uh, that was kind of the punchline of the joke, but you know, I, I guess that that <laughs> some people took that to be an inspiration, and who knows <laughs> what the, yes. the amplitude yeah, techniques yeah. will let us do <laughs> in the right. near future. Right. Right. Yeah, and and yeah, now, but also we have the the quantum correction to the Newton potential, which um, so yeah, the, so, the answer the answer. Let's see, where I must have put, written the answer to this paper somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Yes. That, that you do the end, do the do the calculation, um, which in Feynman diagram techniques is is somewhat painful because some of those vertices are uh, have you know indices to drive you wild, <laughs> but it's now settled down on the the answer. The quantum correction mean is forty one over ten pi. It's a particular potential. Okay, it's okay. It's, it's called the the scattering potential. You take the scattering amplitude, so in states to out states, and you go to low energy and you for and you for you transform it. It's that's not necessarily the potential you use for other things, like bound states. You might mm -hmm. subtract a few diagrams for bound states, but this this seems to be. You know, for our purposes, that's that's a perfectly good explanation. That's the scattering potential. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so from here, you you also go further to sort of extrapolate sort of what what the physical lessons are of the of the correction you find here, which which I think is very worth mentioning because it it was a bit of news to me especially regarding the, um, the the test particle limit and 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 what we should how we should actually envision uh the, the sort of quantum successor to space time right okay so let, let, yeah, i can i can 
talk about that a little bit. Um, the so one thing is that this turned out to be universal. It's independent of mm -hmm. spin, all that, and that is is only seen is first seen by my colleagues Barry Holstein, Andy Ross, by doing the doing lots of different calculations. They difficult way and finding out that even though there's all these different diagrams, they all have different coefficients. They all add up to the same answer. Mm -hmm. But then you can you can now understand it a little bit better by um, doing uh, realizing that all of it follows from just the two graviton cut of a of a Compton ampl amplitude and these guys are universal. And so that the leading two particle cut is also universal. So mm -hmm. we now understand that. And it's interesting, it's been done in different gauges um, where you don't need ghost physical gauges where you only have on shell gravitons. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole storyline there that's probably we don't need to go through. Um, then, then this is the one thing you, you mentioned that there's no test particle limit. And I actually think that is an interesting lesson. Um, the, uh, they're, they're my diagrams. Um, uh -huh. As part of the subset of, of diagrams that I cal we, you calculate over here, the, there, there are some, this, this one and the, these guys, the ones that have two gravitons hooking up to a massive line in sort of this triangle shape. Mm -hmm. um, so the ones that I I have here are, are typical of that. Um, and so you might think of taking a test particle as taking one particle very heavy and this one very light, for example. Yeah. And when you do the classical corrections, so the would you look at the classical corrections that follow from this? This this diagram is proportional to little m. This diagram is proportional to big M. And mm -hmm. so by taking M to zero, actually, do I have that backwards? Yeah, actually, this one, I have it backwards. I'm sorry. Let's, ah. let's hit the eraser so that I get it right. Um, this one follows from the loop, and the in the loop is big M. And so this one is big M, and this mm -hmm. one is little. OK? And so by taking little m small, you forget about the effects of the light particle, and then you then get a test particle moving in the gravitational field. Yeah. But if you if you look at the quantum effects, the quantum effects of these two are exactly equal to each mm -hmm. other. Um, and and so the, the this property over here actually is, is important. You can't factor the diagrams into just the interaction of this particle. The interaction over here matters, and it matters whether this is a photon or a graviton or or something or a massive particle. This is this side of the interaction is different. Yeah. And yeah. so and there's a physics reason for the, why this is the case is that here you're basically sampling the gravitational field at one point you know here's here it comes you sample it right there here, right you're not you're sampling this is sort of like a tidal effect this is a gravity exactly. that propagated a long distance so it propagates a long distance samples the gravitational field over here propagates backwards um so this is like almost like the quantum effects are sort of like extended bodies because they're Surrounded themselves by a virtual bath of of part of gravitons. Right, so, right, right, right. So, so the 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 both massive particles and massless particles. You can't you can't um, take the m goes to zero limit and and get the quantum corrections or neglect the quantum corrections of that. They're independent of the mass. Indeed, and, and that's that's very interesting because that it 
probably has some bearing you know if you, if you went and then relativized all of this and sort of thought of it in terms of um geodesic probes on a on a space-time background or something you probably can't uh, maintain that picture necessarily um right. as, so, as a consequence yeah so one of the consequences then is is that geodesics become sort of ill-defined and so right. e even better example than, than the massive calculation is this one here where we did the same thing with with massless particles. So here's mm -hmm. a mass, massive one, and then this 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 guy down here might be a photon or a graviton or massless yeah. fermion, something like that. And and here the so basically the same sort of things happen. You get the leading quantum piece. You get the the uh, classical piece. Sorry, the leading classical yeah, yeah, yeah. piece. You get the first classical correction by doing a loop, mm -hmm. which still is sort of fun as the way way to do that calculation. And then you get a quantum piece where there's the h bar that has an extra power of of distance. And here, in this case. It involves a coefficient that's different from different types of massless particles. Mm -hmm. All these massless particles will follow different tra trajectories qu quantum mechanically. Right. And that that then combined with the the comment about no test particles means that that, that you can't you can't define geodesics very well. You know. The, right. You're going to follow the photon line or the graviton line to, to find geodesics, or how about a, a massless scalar? Or, um, they, the idea of geodesics doesn't hold anymore. And it's this tidal effect so that all the quantum particles sample more than just their local environment. Um, and then this, the calculation, the fact that these are different means that that, that sampling depends on the, the type of species that, that you're, you're following. Right. Now, this, so, this is interesting because it, it kind of also points to, um, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm right in saying this, but but does it also point to a um, to what we ought to do with the, the sort of equivalence principle if you were to complete it to a quantum mechanical statement? Because there are multiple ways to set it up, but um, I mean, one of the easiest would be when we're talking about like, uh, or sort of the most fancy ways would be when we're talking about like, you know, sort of having a nice smooth space-time structure with sort of local flatness and thinking in terms of geodesic deviation, or setting everything up in terms of geodesics and so forth. Um, whereas here, it seems like that, yeah, that, that simply can't be the way we think uh, if we take the quantum correction seriously, um, right? Yeah, they. Yes, I guess that, that's 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 right. I mean, they there are these different ways formulations of the equivalence principle, and in some ways, the most fundamental is basically general covariance. The idea of general covariance, and right. and that's not violated by anything that we have here. Indeed, this is uh, the, you still have the covariance, but that covariance doesn't necessarily um as we see here doesn't necessarily imply geodesics and so you your description of the space time at least uh, on a larger scale is it has is not quite as simple as we had before and so many of the f formalisms or phrasings of equivalence principle are no longer appropriate Equivalent, yeah, or, and, or appropriate. But the, right. the basic one of general covariance is still. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the one that wins. Uh, right. But I was also wondering if there was a sort of mirror statement. I'm, I'm sure there is, but but I'm just wondering if you've uh, seen a place where it's written down um, where one actually sees this as it manifests um, in the effective action for gravity now coupled to some uh, probe sort of geodesic action or something like that. How, how should I how should I think about that setup now if, if I was to mm -hmm. um 
Right. So just just because it's like you know like the idea typically would be that this there's a sense that you can talk about the probe approximation by just tuning the the coupling of the of the geodesic action, which you know for ma the massive case is just is just a little m, um, and and you're sort of good. But but here it seems that that yeah, so something else has got to happen. When I think of effective actions, I I. I have an easier time thinking in field space as, as field theories uh -huh. rather than and um in as field theories i would is all these corrections would end up being non-local pieces in the effect of action oh okay um, right right because it's like log or something that... it's log and the fourier transform of log goes like well if you neglect the time things it goes like one over distance cubed it's if so the three-dimensional Fourier transform is one one over distance cubed. I guess four D must be one over distance to the fourth, or just by dimensions. Um, and so you get uh, non-local pieces in the effective action that encompass these terms, but the non-locality changes how is, is is where the physics is. Right. Right. No, that's that's an interesting point. I mean, the reason I'm bringing this up is that, um, you know, there, there's this other story which uh, we can think of. I mean, like when we think about string theory uh, and and sort of go through the sort of classic calculation of the the, the world tree beta functions becoming the the target space um, equations of motion and so forth. We kind of see there that. Well, clearly there isn't a sense in which well we still talk about string backgrounds, but but we don't. I mean, I don't think anybody sort of seriously just thinks about it as a sort of non-dynamical space-time entity, which you know, okay, maybe there's a limit where that, that that's the appropriate way to think, but but clearly the the probe is sort of imposing these restrictions, being the equations of motion of the target space, just just by needing to be consistent and propagating there. But but it looks like even particles have. Uh, a bit more sway than <laughs> we originally sort of give them credit for. And and I mean, the beta functions uh, of relevance here for the string, there are one loop effect, um, right. which I mean, essentially is what's going on here too. So anyway, this is just like a, I guess a tangent, but, but just um, something to mull over. Um, right. So yeah, the beta functions, if you try to, to write out the effects of beta functions in, even in field theory, they also become non-local effective actions. Mm -hmm. Um, because basically, if you have you know running running with log q squared, that then is it becomes you know, let's say f mu nu log log box, f mu nu which log box turns into q squared. Right, um, and you you even have that example, I guess. Uh, I have that example paper, somewhere. Yeah. I'd probably do that. Somewhere. I think it's oh yeah, well it's down there for gravity. I guess it's up there for yeah, that, that's the gravity version. Um, I I think I. Headed up here in the fermion version. It's a point of, I. Yeah, well, sort of the the opposite <laughs> limit is the one that we briefly right. discussed, of having a sort of integrating out a massless or, or nearly massless. Uh... There we go. I, that's yeah. Right. So if you, if you have a, a massless particle and you you get look at that log q squared, that turns into a non-local piece f log box f and log boxes is a non-local effect uh, piece. It's actually a very, you know, in, it, it, log box is, is a, should be a research topic because <laughs> it, it in the general covariant framework, it, it contains in, a lot of information. There's some ambiguity in it, but in some sense, this is rep representing the, the one loop, um, effects it, it it then carries all the propagation of these fields here it, it it's quite a complicated object uh, and i don't well i have to say that one uh, place where i've great... seen it yeah i mean one place where i have seen quite a bit of discussion about log box is in um treatments of the cfd generating functional in in sort of like this osborne style way yes. of doing things where everything's a source like you, you upgrade everything to a source and then basically what you find is that 
the CFT generating function is just littered with things like this. Uh, right. And then you sort of recursively define the Osborne equation in terms of the hierarchy of these log boxes and then derivatives thereof. Um, right. And yeah, it was just very, very interesting to see that. I mean, they played such a crucial role even in the gravitational effective action where, yeah, um, yeah well, I guess we, we can we can go to that. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, so the the log boxes in the gravitational action, you know, first, came to prominence by Barvinsky and Bilkovsky. Mm -hmm. And they also have papers detailing the corrections here, the non-local corrections. It's an it's a very interesting topic. Um hasn't hasn't found a lot of physical applications, but nevertheless, conceptually I find it one of the most interesting problems in in the field theory of general relativity is how to represent the effect of action for these non-local terms. Right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, I mean, at, at, at minimum, there's uh okay, I guess, I guess one other thing that we should, we should bring up at this point, just because we, we, we went over it was when you said that the beta functions um, know about these, these sorts of terms, it, it, we should sort of talk about what we mean, what you mean by sort of physically running couplings versus um, what, ones that don't, because th that also ties into uh, what's going on here. Right. That, that, that's right. So let's, yeah, let's let's do that. Let's, let's look at at um, the cosmological constant. This is my. This is one where there's a lot of debate, even by experts, but I think the mm -hmm. answer is clear, and I think. There's a community that that understands this, and the the point is that many of the times when you are looking at running coupling constants in usual theories, you're doing mass independent renormalization, and yeah. then following the one over epsilons, then ends up following log q squareds, because if yeah. if you're mass independent, then the log q squareds and the log the one over epsilons come together. So right. following the divergences works in those settings. It doesn't work for massive particles. And we know this even from QED. The, the, when you do the top quark loop, you get a one over epsilon, but you don't get a log Q squared. When you're at low energies, you get log M squared. Yeah. So the top quark doesn't contribute to the running of the electric charge at low energies. So following one over epsilons or log lambdas, so one over epsilon, log mu squared, log lambda squared where lambda is some cutoff all those don't capture the uh, capture re physical running even though they are they are cutoff dependencies or immune dependencies physical running only comes from the log q squared and that's right that's a calculation but if you do the 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 cosmological constant renormalization you only get for massive particles, you only get log m squared. Um, right. And there's an easy uh, easy way to see that you can't. Is it goes back to this effect that they, you get non-local terms to um, uh, to describe the 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 effects of of the quantum loops. There is no non-local term that can look like lambda. So you know the, the Lagrangian mm -hmm. is square root of minus g lambda. There's no way to make that it, into a non-local term. And if you do the expansion here, this starts off at leading order in the gravitational field. So the renormalization can actually be calculated from the, the tadpole diagram. Yeah. So I can do so, the so what you mean is that if you, if you do like a background field expansion, expanding the square root g yes. is a g plus h and that uh, going on. Exactly. Now, if you do background right. field expansion, the 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 first term that you get is is a linear term in the background in the quantum field, and so you could well or back or I'm sorry the background field you can do the the correction to that is is the tadpole diagram. The, there'll be corrections that look like bubbles, et cetera. But this this can never contain any momentum dependence. Right. Because right. there's nothing to do. 
and that that then just gives you the log. It gives you divergence, but it comes with log m squared. Right. And if you if you do it, you get exactly the same same number from here. You have to get that answer by general covariance. Um, it's you don't the log this bubble could have log q squared in it, but but if you look at the constant piece that goes into log lambda, it's it's um just that there's right. no there's there, and, there's no log q squared. And similarly for g as in Newton's constant. So yeah, g is also the same. There, um yes. So you have uh you have one over g times times just the curvature. It's you can't split up the curvature into two different terms. Yeah, you know, there's some. I always wonder if if there's some magic combination that it could be, you know, a connection log log box. Ah, I see. That could be somehow made into generally covariant, but the answer is that you don't get that in 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 a real field theory loop. Um, you you just get yeah. the. And the, I guess the, the the curious fact there is that if you have well, basically, if you're, if you're in a compact space, then you can sort of eliminate the two derivative term of the in the metric. Well, you know, like you just sort of like that just becomes a boundary term in the Einstein-Hilbert, and okay. so all you really have are just sort of like combinations of the Christoffel symbols. So, right. so in some sense, if you thought in terms of the Christoffel symbols, it's just you know, on a compact space, the Einstein-Hilbert action can just be thought of as something purely quadratic with no derivatives, because the derivative terms are like a, a total derivative. It's right. a non-covariant term, but still, it, that's like one of those, I don't know if that's the root of the reason why you won't get that, but I mean, I'm not surprised that you won't get something that looks like gamma log box or anything like that, because it just doesn't seem like, I think it'll just be subsumed in something like that. Yeah, it's uh, hard to make it possible to make it covariant as far as I can see. Yeah, um, yeah. Interesting. You know, the, yeah, and and so so just to sort of doing the following. There's, I mean, so Woodard and Dezer have the idea of doing. Uh -huh. SR, and that's that's the order two derivatives, and so that's the type of thing that you could get. You can get non in principle that could be a non-local piece. You can't do that for for lambda. There's no way to you know do one over box constant one over box. But this, there is a there is a way to do a non-local piece at a two derivative order. Um, it it you know, so this is the conformal you know, anomaly contribution in in two dimensions, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In two dimensions, that's conformal anomaly. In um, four dimensions, it's it's uh, r one over box square box square right. r. Is is more the anomaly, um, indeed. It's this regard so, term, whatever. Yeah, right. But yeah, uh, but the, you know that's an interesting observation. But it doesn't seem to arise in any field theory. I mean, mm -hmm. the only way I can imagine getting it in a field theory is if I had a a massless field times R, and I exchange that field. So here's phi exchange. I get one right. phi one one R. But I have to know that I have that massless field in my. So you theory. mean like if you have this non I, I don't non minimal it as coupling? The Grangian anymore. I just treat it as, as as an interaction piece that looks like that. I see. That's a that's a digression, but it's. I I find this this issue intriguing. Right. No, no, it is very interesting. So, but but just to go back to our discussion here, I guess we should clarify sort of what people mean when they do occasionally talk about the renormalization of Newton's constant and right. how they phrase the puzzle of the cosmological constant problem when they say, well, uh, look at this crazy sort of cancellation that happens. But I mean, let's start with the second one, maybe. I mean, the point there being, I mean, am I right to say that the point there is that this is just a story we tell. Ultimately, all you really get to measure is the value of the cosmological constant as we have it now. and right who canceled whom to get it okay that it, it's it's an interesting fact but but it's not like there's a physical process in which you can invoke those uh degrees of freedom that went into <laughs> went into the cancellation like you would if you had a running coupling for instance that you could sort of access 
their effect by looking at the way in which the coupling runs. Right. Yes, that's right. So it's, it, you know, we, the, the calculation is sort of an illustration of what the issue is. The, there's a change in the cosmological constant that goes like some heavy particles as a fourth power. You know, so there are lots of contributions that, that we know to that and they're indefinite. You know, they have to be absorbed into the renormalized value. And the final answer is smaller than, than let's say, you know, log four pi times that. It's it's a small number. So it's it's um it is the puzzle why it's so small, but that's from an effective field theory point of view, you just say, Well, I've gone and measured it, that's what it is. I don't need to know anymore. But you know, it is a puzzle. Um, but the it's these are constant the the Lambda and G don't run in the effective field theory limit anyhow. Right. Um, they, they, their, their renormalization is just constants. Right, right. And and similarly, when, when people talk about the renormalization of of Newton's constants, say in the context of like um corrections to the Bekenstein Hawking formula, um all they really mean is again something similar where we're, we're just like redefining what we mean by G, uh, you know, the, shifting it, but but ultimately the measured value of G is is what it is. Um, yes. And there, there is an, another longer story which I also participate in is, is the people who study these um, scale dependence using a functional renormalization group like the people who do asymptotic safety. Right. Um, I, so my argument there is that the, the they're running that they're that they're finding there is, is not to be used in physical processes. And so I always put this in physical processes. It may be a meaningful thing to do in in the context of what they're calculating, but it shouldn't be used in phenomenology. Right, right. I can yeah, give a, much yeah. long, a longer talk on on that, but you, but uh, don't get me going too much on it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, we can again like plant a flag there because because indeed right. I did find your paper on that, uh, as in you do have a paper titled "A Critique of the Asymptotic Safety" or something to that effect, which I do recommend uh, viewers <laughs> check out. Um, so, so I guess the conclusion then is that, well, actually it's the C1 and C2 couplings of the curvature squared terms that actually do have the chance of running. So those guys have, those guys have renormalization group running. And if you, you know, you went out and measured it at some scale, let's say I measured it at the scale where the energies are some renormalization scale. You could just put a subscript there. This is a measured quantity. And then this is the the running and so this right. coefficient d here is the beta function for those mm -hmm. um so that 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 part behaves like a normal normal running parameters and is real physical running right very interesting yeah so i guess we've sort of already touched on it but um the the everything we've discussed so far kind of is a, is like an advertisement of why the non-local contributions to the effective action are as uh, as important as uh, as we now see, as in they sort of deserve special attention because they have, they have the upshot of um, imprinting themselves in, in low energy physics. Um, right. so, so I guess briefly, What's the landscape here? So you mentioned the Bar um, the Vilkovsky Barvinsky um, approach uh, and the calculations they've done, but but what's what's the work that needs to be done here? Uh, well, so yeah, I'm from yeah my my issue in general relativity is understanding what this really means. Mm -hmm. Um, you, using flat space 
representations for what log boxes can't be made um, is, is it depends somehow on the background fields. Yeah. And there's also in the case when if this was our menu log box or menu, there actually needs to be some Wilson lines in between here. Um, yeah. These are different points and so somehow log box has to contain Wilson lines in that case. And so it has a different meaning um, in the scale with the scalar fields and uh, tensors around it. And I know I that's I think the you know if you're interested in the, the non-locality structure, that's that's in, important to figure out how to best write one over box, a uh, log box. And different definitions differ by by things that may or may not be physical. I, yeah. I probably can't can't uh, go too much on that here. Uh, to, to yet an, another topic, but I think that's an interesting place where we our understanding is weak at this stage. Indeed. So, so well, maybe I could put it another way. Um, for for those of us interested in things like string theory or or what what have you, so you know, for for, for sort of these candidate theories of quantum gravity, um. Would it be? I mean, it's, is is there a is there a sort of um, a bullseye here to try to hit? Uh, yeah. Is this a um, is this an avenue, let's say, of uh, bringing some of the alleged power of those alleged UV completions to to bear? Yeah, I. That's a good point. Is that you know so. One of the things that we would like to see of any UV completion is, is trying to understand how it generates the low energy effect of Lagrangians. And, you know, for, for example, what, what are the predictions of for, for the coefficients of those? There should be, for each theory, a unique prediction for what the low energy Lagrangian is, the local piece and the non-local piece. And the they the there'll be a high energy completion of whatever this log box is also um and so yeah i it it is you know i think the 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 general statement is that there is a a each a complete uv complete theory should have as a mission trying to get from its UV complete theory down to the effect of Lagrangian. Indeed. And, so so and sort of do like the, that, the matching that ideally. Is success, what, one measure of success is, is not just saying that the, looking at the UV, but looking at the infrared. Right, right. And, and speaking of the infrared, that is something that you mentioned, which is, um, sort of further so so i guess my audience is probably like they don't need to be told that uh, finding the uv completion is uh is a problem worth pursuing that's you know and that's that's everybody's goal and perhaps that is what we should think of as the problem of quantum gravity is sort of finding the uv completion um right and, and you have this very nice sort of brief uh paragraph here that that lays that lays that program out um but yeah the the next point i i really was hoping you would elaborate on which is the sure. question of the extreme infrared yeah the, the um the one the one property of general relativity that differs from other effective field theories that we play with um is that there also is some technical difficulty that comes in the low energy limit, which may or may not be a fundamental issue. But okay. to say, since we don't know what it, how to solve the technical issue, we, we don't know how what what's going on. And then basically it comes from the fact that when when you have other effective field theories, the 
as you go to the extreme infrared limit, nothing much happens. The, you get you get better and better predictions because uh -huh. your your effects are smaller and smaller. Um, but here in, in gravity, the the classical background that we have, you know, the the or the if you think of a classical background on fluctuation, the gra the gravitational effects build up over long distances in the classical piece. And so the classical metric can can get large in, if you go far enough away from any given point. Uh, so right. my example is, is basically the, if you, this is the Riemann normal coordinate expansion of, of a metric around a flat, you know, you can always choose to be locally flat. And then the, the first corrections that are curvature dependent but if i go far enough here so i have a curvature if i go far enough i get something big and my suddenly my metric is big and so i'm not expanding around a small metric but a, a big one and i don't know how to do that so there's a technical right. point. <laughs> but but it but it may actually be a physical point because you know for example the the issue of black holes comes in here um black holes are a place where the metric function itself gets large. So if I'm using from coordinates that are appropriate for large distances, the metric at the horizon blows up. Or if I use one fields that are relevant near the horizon, then it blows up as I'm trying to get out to infinity. Yep. Um, so the 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 metric has it changes between the horizon and and um infinity in a, in a very non non trivial way but then we know that that's tied up with all these effects like like, like horizons um and so some of the the questions of how you would propagate past the black hole when you when you when some of the propagation over very long distances actually falls into the black hole that's a it's an interesting question, right? And there's there's there has been recent work by Bob Walden and some co and collaborators who I won't be able to remember everybody's name. On. I apologize to all the collaborators, but um, where they calculate some of these effects, it's not necessarily just for gravity; it's also for QED. If you have a, right. Uh, yeah, photon. yeah, perhaps you're talking about oh. like uh, Satish Chandran, Gautam Satish Chandran, and some other people. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are very interesting papers. Yeah, those those are basic illustrations of this effect, and they apply not just to gravity, but but they apply in a gravitational ba background. Um, so there's quantum mechanical effects like that that we don't know how to deal with, and maybe change the physics. Of, Maybe a real physical changes in quantum mechanics at very long distances. Right. No, that's, that's very interesting. But but again, like this brings up a point that I've always I've always had a little bit of a uh, so maybe a pet peeve of mine. But basically, like the, the point that you make here goes into how we think about modeling isolated systems in in, in general relativity, where yes. normally so so in a sense when we talk about local flatness and we sort of say that for the purposes of everything we do you know we're everything kind of seems flat we don't really need to care so long as we're staying clear of the the cosmological sort of radius of the the horizon radius um but on the other hand our solutions sort of take seriously this notion of asymptotic flatness and you know you really just think of doing like some large conformal transformation to get rid of the the kind of infinity that you're describing you know in one or the other way and that, that kind of goes back to your point here you know like the expansion you write down there is sort of like the physically appropriate one when we talk right. about an isolated system because we're talking about a region where you know so long as the curvature sc scale stays small you can pretend like we are in a flat space but, but but really, I think that one of the things that I've, I don't find is sort of ha has been adequately addressed, even with all the sort of cool stuff going on with soft theorems and BMS and all that kind of stuff, is what exactly do we mean by asymptotic flatness in a physical setting? It's only for all practical purposes. I mean, we know for a fact that we have a 
positive cosmological constant, perhaps, and a cosmic horizon and so forth. So, so I mean, it's, it's not really like, th there isn't any real sense in which we have an asymptotically flat physical setting that we're dealing with. Um, and yet it's clear that for for practical purposes and numerical sim simulations included, it's a good approximation. Um, but but yeah, sort of dotting the I's and crossing the T's there, sort of it's a similar kind of question to, to, to what you're describing here, which is sort of how you... <laughs> uh, and, and something goes back to this test particle business that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, you living here are sensitive to physics that's very far away. Um, In what sense are you a test? Idle effects. Um, how do you how do you adequately de describe your physics here without knowing what's what's far away? Right. And yeah, and yes, I don't, I don't think that's been adequately addressed. I think that is an interesting frontier. I, I, Perhaps it's the one that we're sort of um, better suited to try and address just because there seems to be a lot of so sociological sort of momentum around things, the holographic things, you know, let's just put it, you know, yeah. make a very big umbrella for now. Um, and, you know, there seems to be like, you know, thought of very seriously, there, these are sort of claims about classes of solutions of the Einstein equations, if you thought about, if you wanted to think about them as such, you know, like at least in AD, at the ADS asymptotics, there's claims about basically saying that the kind of CFT generating functional I was describing a little bit before, which also has those log boxes <laughs> floating yeah. around everywhere, is the effective, the, the sort of on shell effective action of, uh, uh, you know, some class of solutions. And um, maybe to, to really to really bring all this to bear physically, maybe these are the sorts of questions to ask. But but I guess I, so that could sort of bring us to the concluding um, part of the discussion, which is what are the questions worth asking? <laughs> sort of right. just just in addition to what we already talked about. Um, right. Yes, Lee. So, I mean, I think we have talked about what I think are the 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 biggest issues in the effect of field theory approach to this, which is these, the, what happens in the extreme infrared, and then how to describe these, the quantum corrections in a, in, away from flat space. Yeah. Where, where, where our techniques work. Um, I think if you know some people would would say the uh, the appropriate, most appropriate place to look at some of these questions is is actually in de Sitter space. So people like Richard Woodard have done an enormous amount of work in de Sitter space, indeed, um, because it's it's in some sense the simplest realization of of some of these problems because they. You have you do have funny infrared effects and you like the secular ones and so on. It's like, yes, exactly. And, uh, uh, so Woodard has done a lot of exploration there, and I I personally would need to understand the physics there more. It's, it's the sitter space has always scared me, and so it's, <laughs> I see. Uh, but I think it's an excellent place to study some of these and so maybe that's a a uh, an understanding of how these quantum effects live in decider space trying to make sense of what has been seen so far is, is a, a very worthy goal too right okay uh well this was this is great I, th I think we i think we managed to cover everything that uh <laughs> Uh, okay, well, yeah. well, all the topics in the in the paper, um, but also uh, almost everything that I I wanted to sort of um, hear your opinion about. Um, so, before I let you go, um, you should mention. So, so I noticed that you do have a YouTube channel, uh, yes, and um, yeah. So, so I'll I'll link that in the description, and um, okay. I mean. Yeah, if there's anything else you'd I, like to advertise. 
Yeah, if you're, if you're doing advertisements, I also have a, a web page that links to various courses that I've taught or um, it's some some extra resources. Uh, yeah. I wish I had the time to make that a, a full community resource. Um, it's I started trying to build it, putting a lot of, of great references there. Um, it, to some extent, has then fall, fallen into places where I post my own stuff. But I think there, <laughs> I are, there are some resources there. And if you're interested in following these, there are links to other things uh, that are fun things. Anyhow, so that's uh, a little resource. It's a web page called uh, General Relativity is the Quantum Field Theory. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't noticed this. So I'll it definitely be, add that to the description. It can be traced from my own web page because I, I link it to, as part of my, as part of self-advertisement. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Um, okay. So, uh, well, you've been very generous with your time. Um, John, I, I very much appreciate the discussion we had. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I'll um, yeah, well, um, link these link these web pages in your YouTube channel. And yeah, thank you for the discussion. So if you've gotten this far, to my listeners, please like, uh, subscribe, comment, uh, and share. This is theoretically podcasting, and I'll see you all later. <laughs>